Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden and today we're doing our commentary for X-Men Origins Wolverine. So I hope you guys are ready for some fun. Uh, with the Deadpool movie coming out this week, I thought it would be a cool idea to go ahead and do the commentary for Deadpool's first cinematic appearance in X-Men Origins Wolverine. The, uh, seventh greatest X-Men movie, also known as the worst X-Men movie. Um, so uh, there's no reason to delay. I am, um, I've got it open, so I'm going to press play in five, four, three, two, one. Uh, okay. So, we got the Fox logo going, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, don't have much plans for this. Just thought it'd be fun to go ahead and talk about this movie. Uh, you're not gonna hear any audio from it, because we don't want to step on any copyright toes. But you can follow along, too, as we go on this wonderful journey through this terrible, terrible movie. Um, oh man, I remember when this one came out. So, I was... About halfway through university, or as you Americans call it, college, at the time when this movie came out, and we, uh, we managed to get a hold of the pirated version that most people use to watch this movie. And that pretty much says it all. The fact of the matter is, is that we didn't really miss much, because the pirated one apparently was missing some special effects, and you can kind of tell. But, yeah, who cares? <laughs> It was uh, just a bad movie, and this is not going to be a, a great time. And it's going to be interesting to kind of get into what went wrong. Like, I wasn't involved in the production or anything like that, obviously, but something something fell apart here. Now, at the time, I don't know. It wasn't like uh, this was the absolute worst state of the Fox franchise before this came out. But this really brought the whole franchise to a standstill for a while. And the rot had already begun last movie with X-Men The Last Stand. This movie really just sort of cemented the demise until things kind of picked up again for the Wolverine movie, which is kind of a sequel to this. That worked a lot better on the whole. And, uh, First Class, which was also a really fun little excursion. Oh, oh, someone's dead. So this is the very beginning, part that I don't even remember, but I knew was going to happen with the whole business of Logan's very beginnings. I suppose this is his real origins, I guess. Is that Hugh Jackman playing his father? That seems weird. Let's see. Um, it's a little weird that Sabretooth is just kind of his brother, I guess. Who played Wolverine's dad? Looks just like him. Max Cullen played him, I think. I can't even tell. Oh, well. And there's Sabretooth. Or his dad? Oh no, that's... Oh, okay. Well, I'm very confused already. <laughs> so we're off to a great start with this. Um, and there he runs off. To go scream, I assume. There's a lot of screaming in this movie. And if it wasn't like early in the morning that I was recording this. I was originally going to record this with my buddy, but uh, that didn't quite work out, so we're going to just try it with me going solo. Well, they aren't screaming. Apparently Sabretooth was with Logan from the very beginning. And, you know, I don't, I don't actually remember what the actual X-Men Origins comics were like, but I, I feel like they handled the material a lot better than this. I know people were big fans of those comics. I never really got into them personally that much, but I mean, anything's got to be better than this, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Here, 
we're already off to the races. And I admit, the next part is actually my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> um, we're gonna get to that soon. Once we get past the very initial flashback stuff, which is kind of boring, whatever. Here we go. So yeah, I guess we start with the Civil War. We just, uh, when they, they start going through all the different wars and watching Sabretooth and Logan just fighting them for <laughs> reasons beyond understanding, but you kind of get the sense in that that's just what their life was, was just fighting in wars and surviving because they could survive everything. And oh man, this actually is really good. <laughs> I don't know if like maybe they kind of focused on doing more of this in the movie, but as just this little montage and opening, uh, there's Will I Am's kind <laughs> of credits. He actually isn't so bad in this movie either. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is actually great. I honestly don't see anything wrong with this uh, little opening scene. Because it's just so friggin' awesome. Flipping from one war to the next, just showing them like fighting side by side. It really establishes everything you need to know about Sabretooth and Logan. and uh, like It's just crazy because everything's going downhill from here. Uh, like We're okay right now. But it all just falls apart after this. And, but this is inspired. This is, this is great. This is a movie. This is part, like, this is a scene from another movie, it feels like. Cause it's just, this brilliant montage. Like, look at that. Sabretooth jumping around like an animal. That is perfect. See, I'm getting sucked into it. No worry, I'll start talking a little more once we get past the actual good part of this movie. Okay. We're already kind of just fading out. Oh, see, look, Sabretooth relishes in the killing. But now we're in Vietnam, and it really doesn't matter. It's enough. Ah, Logan's starting to develop a conscience. Like, 30 years later. <laughs> well, 30 years later from World War II, when he, you start to see the, the doubts. All right, well... I have a feeling... Uh, oh. Implied rape? I didn't remember that happening. Which I assume Logan's about to stop. It's been a little while since I've seen this movie. I don't think I've watched it since I first saw it. So this will kind of be interesting to go back to and see like what does work and doesn't. And honestly, this opening montage I remembered enough to, like I knew ahead of time, yeah, this was going to be the best part to, to kind of enjoy it while it happened. But this is great. Yeah, and Logan has the bone claws. Now look, I know the Bone Claws have long been a staple in the comics, but that sh oh, that stuff has never made any sense. I mean, honestly. <laughs> yes, I did almost swear there, but I'll try and keep the language clean for this. My apologies. You really shouldn't be listening to this if you're a kid anyhow. This is a... Uh, I forget what this movie's rated, but it can't possibly be that appropriate for kids. I know it is very PG'd up compared to its spiritual sequel, Wolverine, which on the whole works. I mean, from this point on, it's... Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's Stryker. Again, there's, there's aspects of this continuity that I don't really care for. And the Bone Claws are kind of one of them, because it, it makes sense from the perspective of, like, Logan evolved that way, and that's his mutation, but... How are bone claws supposed to cut things? I don't, I don't understand it that well. And I do kind of think it's, I kind of compare it to certain animals, like maybe a rhino or an elephant, where they have these pseudo bone materials with their ivory that kind of could maybe be considered like feasible in the form of some kind of bone claw. But the metal claws make a lot more sense, even if they are given to Logan, like they're manufactured. Um, so that's a bit of a flaw, but, you know, it doesn't break the movie or anything. You know, that's all to come. So they pretty much get them right into our weapon axe from the get-go. Which I can't really blame them. Oh, hey, look! There's the reason we're, uh, we're freaking talking about this. It's Deadpool. 
with Ryan Reynolds. You know, he's okay here. Like, he's got his usual, yeah, like, he would bet a couple of stories at your ex-girlfriend's wedding. They will never, ever forget it. And, yeah, it's not that funny. But, um, they have the, the Merc with the mouth attitude going. At first. I forget who that guy's supposed to be. I'm gonna have to leave the Wikipedia page for this thing open because honestly, I can't remember half of the characters in this movie. Which is a weird thing too. X-Men has a lot of these great characters, many of whom Fox has yet to take advantage of. But you get the uh, impression from this thing they're either are unwilling to rely on some of these extraneous characters or they just didn't find anything interesting of that. That just doesn't make sense to me. There's so many cool characters and they have to create like a unique one with uh, Dominic Monaghan there. Apparently he was going to be Beak originally, but they made him into this electrical character who has no real X-Men counterpart. Um, <laughs> Will I Am plays John Wraith. Um... I don't know, he's fine in this, I guess, kind of. Again, I don't understand why they weren't making use of other better characters. The blob is great in this, though. Uh, I thought that was pretty well depicted. And here we are, with barely any introduction or reason to care about any of these characters, they're going to go and do a mission. I guess this is sort of their introduction, but it is weird, and most of them don't go on to do anything important. But whatever. Here's Agent Zero. Um, not much to say about this guy. He's okay, I guess. <laughs> Alright guys, just kind of feels like a boring character. You have like Omega Rad, Ajax, all these interesting characters, and they go with ones that I just don't feel had much significance. Really shoots people nicely. Somehow dodges all these bullets. Somehow. <laughs> and they don't even really get into it, like, to the why of how we can do this. Oh, look at that. Now, that was one of the scenes that looked like a joke when we watched it the first time, with all the special effects kind of phased out. But we could tell what they were going for, and it really doesn't change the scene. <laughs> we were just laughing at this point, because it's like, oh man, this is going to be a treat. Because we got to see a movie without, like, all of its CGI done. And it really... Gives you a sense of where things started stop. But that being said, the CGI just doesn't look that great. Well, that's kind of neat for the blob to do, but... Yeah. You can tell I'm really excited for you know, it's going to go down. Why is William Stryker in on this mission with them? Why wouldn't he be, like, their contact, or just, like, on the helicopter? Oh, I guess so he can set up what they're eventually going to do to Wade Wilson. And Deadpool is not that charming in this comic, or in this movie. <laughs> um, he's okay, but he really doesn't uh, bring a lot of energy to the table. At least not in the sense uh, of the Deadpool we all know and love. And it's funny, like, I do think uh, Ryan Reynolds is the right choice for this character as, as, like, a cast member. And I hear he's good in the movie and, like, in his new movie, and it's going to probably go a lot better than this. I understand it's very confidently made, as opposed to this monstrosity. And again, this isn't really explained that well, like, how he's able to do this to bullets. It doesn't necessarily fit in with... Deadpool's character, <laughs> he slices a bullet in half with his sword. Okay, so it's going to be that kind of movie. And he can just block sword bullets. Block bullets with the sword, that is. I, I don't know. So, yeah, Deadpool. <laughs> and that's about as close to Deadpool as we ever get. So no mask. Vaguely keeping his wit and humor. 
And just none of the energy. Oh, hey, but there's Wraith. Who apparently just didn't really get along with the casting director, but somehow made it onto this movie. Likely due to Hollywood politics and all that. And, uh, he just has these vague nightcrawlery powers because he wanted to play mutant with the same powers as Nightcrawler. So why not? Why not do that? Um, he is playing like John Wraith or Kestrel, who is a real mutant in this part of Weapon X, so you can give them that credit. I'm pretty sure he was in the Ultimate Comics a bunch. Yeah. So that works okay. They didn't really keep the fact that he's like older in the comics. Whatever. Some small things like that are okay in adaptation. But big things aren't. And, and, you know, Ryan Reynolds, even him kind of being like this pre, dare, pre Deadpool character isn't, isn't terrible. Like he doesn't have his mask yet. He doesn't have cancer yet. It would have been fine to set up all this stuff for later. Um, but. <laughs> Well, I assume most of us know what we get later isn't quite the same thing. And yeah, just a special, special, special moment with Deadpool going on later on. Yeah. What have they been doing? Just busy fighting over adamantium. Blah, blah, blah. So, we have this conflict between Logan and Sabretooth going on. It's all very exciting. Uh, <laughs> you can kind of tell they were trying to build up to this with, uh, with the earlier scenes during the war and Logan trying to hold, uh, Sabretooth off as he ignores all the other mercenaries who are killing people in the exact same scene. I don't really want to make fun of this movie too much. Like, I would not just sit back and enjoy a good comic book movie, but... Oh, there's so much incompetence, and we're just getting to the very beginning of it all. Um, and you can kind of tell... I don't really feel any individual person is it responsible for this. There's bigger issues going on, last-minute rewrites, um, directors changing hands, and it kind of being passed down, and... Fox not really caring enough about quality control, that it all just mixes for a pretty lousy movie. You talk uh, to people who are in the film industry or just film critics, and they kind of point out the amount of work and people involved in this. It's a miracle that any movie is good at all these days. Uh, and this is an example of where it just didn't mix. And I, I know this cast isn't that bad. I can't speak to Will I Am's acting prowess, but Hugh Jackman, Leif Schreiber, uh, Dominic, Dominic Monaghan, uh, Ryan Reynolds, they're, they're all competent actors. Um, so it's either has to do with direction or the writing or just them not having anything to work with. I think direction's a big part of it. Gavin Hood is the one who made this. He's done stuff like Ender's Game and, uh, Nothing else I know about. I'm sure he's directed other movies, but I haven't seen any of them. And it all just feels very mediocre. And you have a screenplay by David Benioff, who works on Game of Thrones. God only knows how that all happened. Um, I believe, you know, you can kind of tell, like, David probably had some of the good ideas that just don't work in this movie, like the opening montage and certain aspects of the story, and then it just got given to these less competent individuals, like during, uh, there was a writer's strike back then, and I think it just got passed down. Like, I know the guy who wrote the Amazing Spider-Man movies rewrote this script, so before you go blaming David Benioff, who is a pretty good writer if you've seen Game of Thrones, um, I think it's pretty clear who is responsible for this mess. 
and it's got like I point straight at the direction and all these people who rewrote it. And James Vanderbilt. And I mean really, like that guy did friggin' the amazing Spider Man, and I think that says enough. And then you have the guy who wrote Hitman, the A Team, A Good Day to Die Hard. Hitman Agent forty seven, Swordfish, like it is not a phantasmic screenwriter to say the least. So yeah, you can kind of see where the rot comes in. And um, while I've been talking, the movie has ground to a screeching halt as we've gotten all the Weapon X stuff out of the way, all that war montage stuff out of the way, and we're now in the boring, awful part of this movie where nothing happens. And I don't know if Logan has run into Silver Fox yet. He's basically run. Dominic here, who I know from, he was in uh, Lord of the Rings and Lost, and he's a great actor. Very charming, even charming in this, but... Ugh. Like, what is the point? So he is working in a carnival now. And I kind of like that aspect of it, too. Where, uh, he, um, he's, like, they all just become carnival freaks and <laughs> stuff like that. Blob and all those guys. That's a pretty clever trick, man. He, he had the light bulb going when it was unscrewed and unplugged. I would be impressed. Just be like, how did you do that? But no, they just make fun of him and leave. And, uh, yeah. I think this is where Charlie gets killed. <laughs> yeah, I'm of course referring to his lost character, but, uh, what is his name in this movie? He's not even... Chris Bradley. Oh, Chris Bradley is an X-Men character. I just never heard of him. Oh, uh, okay. Huh. Not a huge X-Men character. Which is why I'm guessing he's being killed off here. And honestly... If you had all these powers over electricity, why would you keep all these light bulbs in your home, like on the ceiling like that? Seems like bad planning. But, you know, that's the sort of thing that I can get behind, because it's just like kind of this little detail that fits in kind of with his character, and it makes him practically armed in his own home like this. But he's going to die anyways, because Sabretooth is killing him for some reason. Do we ever... Is there a reason for this? Because they're starting a new Weapon X program, they want to tie up their loose ends or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's all very unclear. Hmm. Weed's gone. Yeah, Deadpool's gone, but don't worry, he'll be back. Oh, what a movie. And then there were fewer. Well, I think you know what's going to happen. Like I said, a lot of screaming in this movie. Oh, my claws are out. I'm sorry. Love interests. <laughs> so now we're just getting into... And look, it's fine that Logan has this romance and stuff, but this is the absolute most boring, broken part of the movie. My dear lord. And, um, the only thing I remember out of all of this is that, uh, Kyla Silverfox here gives Logan the idea for his name of Wolverine. Which I always thought was more of a beard code name, but whatever. Oh, and he's a lumberjack. He's both smoking a cigar. And not wearing a protective helmet. Which, in his defense, he has no need for, but, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know of, the safety boards would see it that way. And there's Striker. And somebody. Is that Zero? He's blurred.
Oh, God. Wouldn't that blow Logan's face off? <laughs> okay, whatever. I mean, he'd live, but it would probably be very uncomfortable to have your cigar shot out of your mouth. <laughs> Well, diversity is nice and all. That doesn't really work when the character doesn't do anything, or has no purpose here other than to just spout nonsense. That's what this movie is, just nonsense coming from every direction. But why would Logan have any interest in any of this? I mean, we know why he will later, but he didn't like any of those people. <laughs> Team X, which is also a really tacky name. And, uh... So, going in for the long haul here. Aren't they in Canada? How is he operating here? I, I guess he can visit and do all this stuff. I thought Weapon X was Canadian, or is that what he means? Then, when, But then the response, I'm Canadian, wouldn't make any sense. But now I'm just picking for this movie because nothing is going on and I have nothing else to do. He's standing here watching his girlfriend. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't set up anything about Logan's character or anything. All we're really getting from this is that he likes her. Something that they've already kind of established a while ago. And I guess she's a kindergarten teacher or something. Which is going to make what's going to happen all the more tragic. I can't believe how much plot we've covered. And we're only like half an hour in. This movie is drags the how out of uh, like stuff that it really doesn't need to and it is skipped happily by a lot of stuff that could have been a lot more interesting. I remember CinemaSins talking about this scene. So we have two gentlemen who are blocking the road having a conversation. For no reason. And then they start harassing him. And they're like, yes, yeah, so, like, you could beat these guys so easily. And they so easily deserve it. <laughs> it's just rude. And I remember Cinema Sins uh chalking this up to just everyone being Canadian, but honestly, I we've never done anything like that. I certainly hope not. <laughs> I cannot say I've ever had a situation in my life anywhere close to this. Like nobody blocks the road to talk like this in the middle of a bridge, in the middle of nowhere like this. They literally could just pull up ahead two feet and talk in peace. <laughs> it makes no sense. And how can you not watch this scene and not notice that? And not just be like, what the hell is going on? I mean, well, I know how, because you, at this point, you'd be so toned deaf to the movie. Oh, this dialogue. <laughs> this is, um... I'm watching this with the captions on, and just seeing some of the lines go by, and they stay on a little longer, and you get some chance to think about them. And it's just a little pointless to say the least. And this whole story is just nonsense. And for this to all be fodder for him taking the name Logan feels wrong. And I'm pretty sure it's not how his character <laughs> came to that name normally, or anything like that. Um, as I recall, 
I'm actually looking this up just so I can get a refresher of what the actual comics did. Um, yeah, I mean, it's similar. It cuts out all the stuff with Itsu and Dokken, though, which is really... I don't know, especially Itsu. It's kind of relevant to his character, like his wife and son. But I guess uh, this movie doesn't really want to go in that direction. So he's a lumberjack, and he learned the name Wolverine. It is amazing how much they diverge from the source material. And while that's fine, they didn't really replace it with anything that ingenious. They just kind of took little bits and pieces of it and cobbled it together into this pretty mediocre story. Oh dear. Well, at least the movie's going to do something in pretty soon. Oh, and I guess Logan can smell Sabretooth. Because they're apparently within... Oh, right, because she dropped him off, because otherwise it wouldn't work. So Sabretooth running around the woods decapitating raccoons? This is what's happening. <laughs> like, that's so, because those are his claw marks. And then he knows exactly where she is and where he's going. But you can talk up to scent, but then why didn't he need to look at the tree or the raccoon? That's actually kind of cool. It looks terrible, but it's a neat idea for a shot. <laughs> Clawing up the car. And we're just wasting time here. He's running through the woods. There's no need to show this. Like, I guess we're supposed to build up suspense, but we know that the timeline's shifted just a bit to... Yeah, like, see? <laughs> She's gone. And he's gone. So him running through the woods is to really matter. And I guess you could say it was building up suspense, but they weren't cutting back and forth very much. They did it once. This movie's lazy. <laughs> like, oh, boy. I bet you he's going to shout. Or just cry. Cry a little bit of both. Crying I could live with, but we're on, like, shout four or five. Wait for it. It is. Sad, I guess. <sighs> the problem is that the movie just rushes through everything. And I get I was just complaining about how the movie brought it to a standstill, trying to establish their relationship, but there wasn't anything special between them. It's not that we saw. Oh, there's the shouting. No! Because for a while, every movie needed to do this. And still kind of does. Have you ever looked up into the sky and shouted no? Because I haven't, and I'm starting to wonder if I'm the weird one. <laughs> now, Sabretooth can be a pretty good character, and I actually think Leaf Shover can kind of fit the role okay. But the guy who played Sabretooth in the first two X-Men movies was, was a lot more fun, though. I felt like he fit Sabretooth a little better. But... He vaguely works as an antagonist. In a lot of ways, he isn't even the primary antagonist of the movie. He's like the tertiary villain. Slash frenemy of Logan. And, ugh. Problem after problem after problem. And I'm pretty sure Logan would just try and murder him right now. Not sure what the stand down is. Oh, there you go. Just, just go. Just charge. No need to menace him. You know you're not going to scare him. And you know he did it. Oh, you want to know why. Oh, that is funny. That is funny, Sabretooth. You don't call, you don't write. Um. Yeah, seems a little heavy-handed, Sabretooth. Could have just showed up at his door and said hello. Probably wouldn't be that welcoming, but he's sure a lot less welcoming now. <laughs> Why did they do slow motion for him being tackled through the door? He said, this movie doesn't... 
act of sense. You can tell the director's just kind of seen a lot of cool action things and is doing them, but there isn't like the thought behind it. Like if you're going to do slow motion, it's to convey something that would happen to you quickly in, in real speed, or just to let like a big moment set in, not at the start of a fight for this little tackle through a door. And they've already done two or three cooler things, like with them being slammed into the truck and all. So this isn't a very well shot action shot scene. Uh, the movie's actually really bad at this. I don't know if that's the director or the choreographer or what, but this is just very lousy action, even for 2009, and that's only like six years ago. Just kind of why we're talking about this today. You guys can kind of walk it back, and that is in the world of comic book movies quite a long period of time, but realistically, it was not that long ago that this came out. There's a reason Ryan Reynolds can still plausibly pull off Deadpool now, even though he did it back then. And it is just funny to compare the two. Uh, I am looking forward to the new Deadpool movie. I have heard good things. I really like the idea of Negasonic Teenage Warhead kind of being a character and Colossus being part of the thing. And the way the movie is shot and set up sounds very interesting because I have heard a, a few reviews of it. So that comes out this Friday. I'm recording this uh, on Thursday. So, uh, should be interesting. I think I'm looking forward to it. I like how they went, like they didn't pull back the punches with Deadpool's character. Like I feel they did here, like this is just a movie of pulling back punches. So it's, I guess Sabretooth broke off his claws. And <laughs> knife wounds. Yeah, that's what claw marks look like. I do like that though. <laughs> He's fine by the time he gets to the hospital. <laughs> So now Logan has a reason to join Weapon X. Well, that's okay, I guess. Uh, now we're just going to go into more things that we've seen. And by things that I've seen, I don't mean just the comics. Like, we see most of the next little bit in X2 when Logan's flashing back to all these seeds. So the point of it now... Well, I'm glad the film glosses over at least some of that, but uh, going into any of it at all is it's silly. A lot of stuff I didn't think through. To be honest, the whole premise of this movie is a little off. Like, Logan's the character that we know the most about his origins and stuff, even if you're just looking at it from the movie's perspective. And he's kind of been the star of the first three movies and all that, so... I don't... I don't understand the point. But there was talk of this being the first in a series of X-Men Origins movies, and they were talking about doing Magneto after this, and honestly, that would have been much better. Probably would have been a lot more better received, and a lot more interesting to people. Like, Logan's origins are fine, but they were already touching on them in X2, and X2 didn't come out that long before this, realistically. And so I don't see the, the point. <laughs> Coming for blood. So is he joining Weapon X or not? I thought he was. I can't even remember because I don't know. I just know vaguely what's gonna happen. <laughs> the, this movie. Well, at least it's very uh, pretty scenery. I don't recall Weapon X being originally kind of set up like this. Weren't they in the dam? That's supposed to be the dam? That doesn't make sense. Well, I guess he did join Weapon X. <laughs> no, this will be extremely painful, Logan. I, uh, I've always kind of liked this aspect of Logan's story. It's played up too much in these movies, but, uh, um, bonding molten metal onto your bones. Dear Lord, the pain must just be indescribable. <laughs> but he could survive it too. Like that's that's one of the more brilliant sides to his character. Whoever thought up that specific aspect of it, it's very. Cla I don't know if that was Chris Claremont or who, but very awesome. 
This dialogue, not so much. <laughs> That's the problem, is that there's all these cool ideas kind of floating around in this movie that never got taken advantage of. I feel like it could have been really good. Like, you have Deadpool, you have this cool idea for showing them in all these different wars. You have the Weapon X stuff. There is a recipe for that. <laughs> He's going to get dog tags with Wolverine on it. And that part is very laughable and cliche. And I get that that's kind of part of his story, but... My girlfriend told me this story, so now I want to take this code in. It just doesn't feel right for his character. Like I said, I forget where he originally got it, but... Yeah. Just a bunch of random generals here to watch this. Munson looks pissed. Oh no, Munson. Munson didn't like X. That's actually a great name. <laughs> just gonna latch onto that for a little bit. So do you think this was Admiral Munson's idea, or is he just here to witness it, to see where like millions and billions of dollars is getting drained to? Is Munson pissed about that? Because he looks pretty upset. <laughs> Why do I have a feeling they're never going to get any of these answers to Munson's plight? Oh, hey, Zero's here. Just launching as well for some reason. Okay. So this would be painful. Like, dear lord. I'm pretty sure the idea of him being in water is so that, like, metal can cool in time or something. Dear lord. We're going to flash back to stuff that happened earlier in this movie, eh? <laughs> Munson wanted to know about uh, why he couldn't give the guy anesthesia. And whether or not he'd survive it. She you think it's something Munson would have asked earlier, but I guess Munson don't give a crud about anyone but Munson. Because he is Admiral Munson, the most important man in the X-Men story of Logan. Munson, please, you must stop this crazy experiment. Yeah. I don't get the flashbacks either. Like, so much of this movie feels like padding. Why would you... I, like, I get the stuff where it's reflecting on her words, but you're showing stuff from Task Force X, uh, Victor also makes sense, but like all this random nonsense, and I just can't help but feel you're putting the stuff in the movie to just pad it out to a good runtime. The fact that it barely clocks in over an hour and a half supports that idea, to say the least. So much of this just comes off as a big old mess. Oh, in Agent Zero, all smug because Logan appears to be dead. But we all know he definitely 100% isn't dead. But Munson doesn't know that. Munson doesn't know anything. Munson doesn't even know mutants exist. And this is all just a revolutionary day for him. And he's going to go off and begin plans for X-Men First Class. Because Munson doesn't give a fudge. <laughs> My god. The guy who can heal from everything is totally fine. Bet you he's gonna burst out of the thing screaming. It's actually kind of neat. I'm not really sure about Striker's motivations. They've never really been that clear. I guess he's just a military guy and he wants to be successful and build all these weapons to protect his country or something. Uh, didn't Striker have a different role in the earlier X Men movies? I don't remember. He... Yeah, he was the guy, yeah, Brian Cox in X2. I mean, I guess that was his same motivation. It felt more like he had, like, a specific vendetta against mutants because his son was a mutant and stuff. They didn't really get into that much here, do they? Or do they?
Maybe he does learn about his son in this. They... He's very much just this general god, that, that shot. And he does it in the form of an axe, because X-Men. Oh god, those claws look so bad. How do the digital effects look worse in this movie than the original X movies? That's a question for the ages. Like, Fox just didn't want to spend any mo money on this at all. At all. I don't know what to say. It blows my mind. <clears throat> Munson is not impressed. It's just funny because the one general who speaks is very deliberately pointed out early on so that you know that he's the, oh, the disapproving general that Stryker works for, which I guess helps inform some of Stryker's ruthlessness or whatever. It's all wildly entertaining, I'm sure. Oh, and he's back in the wilderness doing nothing again. Well, I assume right now it's just an elderly couple driving around. Because this movie doesn't have any padding at all. No padding here. Not all who wander are lost. Does this movie not have any subtlety? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I do like them. Just watching a naked man running through the fields. That's pretty good. That's pretty funny, actually. But still. Like I said, padding and just this plot starts and stops, starts and stops, starts and stops, and it stopped again. And when it stops, like you just lose all the sense of anything, interest, excitement, just goes flushing down the toilet. And people wonder why, like this is the least enjoyed of the X Men movies. And that's not universal. I'm sure pro some people hate the Last Stand more than this, but there's certain aspects of the Last Stand that are kind of memorable and sort of fun. Here, again, there are some memorable and fun moments, but they're few and far between, and there's so much time wasting here. You are naked. I have a gun. You're not on drugs, are you? Let me get you clothes. Like, all of this could have been half of the length. Doesn't he end up staying on this farm for a while? We'll find out in a second, but I have a feeling he will. My god. Naked Wolverine is so much fun. And now this is gonna happen. You know, I really don't like seeing these claws just because they look... They looked okay when they were bone claws, but now they look awful. They look... I don't think they ever looked more fake. It's hard to describe, it just looks very Clone Wars-y. We can see where the CGA stops and the real live-action stuff begins. Especially when they're right in front of his face like that. Oh god, <laughs> like, looks like it just flashes into like a really good cartoon for a second. <laughs> There's a little bit of comedy here, that's not terrible, but... There's a, this thing called pacing and setting a consistent tone. And apparently, like, the director and writers behind this just wanted no part of it. <laughs> no interest in pacing or consistency or anything like that. Because I bet these scenes are really funny and stuff, but they just came after, like, his love interest died. He, like, out of desperation joins this, um, we like, weapons program and gets his body transformed. This is not the right time for, <laughs> like, adventures in the farm. But I guess Logan has to do some more character building, even though his character really is at the right place to keep the story going. Like, like I said, there's these diversions that I assume are just here to pad out the movie. <laughs> I, the, see, this is one thing they should do uh, a little more of. Like, Logan just knows about all these old cars and stuff, and... It's it's the same aspect of his character that's present in Captain America that is just great. Is that he's been around so long that his tastes, like, are those of a very old man. And sometimes much older than that. Like, really, he's older than that guy <laughs> that took him in. But, uh, they don't do that very much. 
That's one of the better aspects of his character, though, is that he's familiar with all these old, like, figures in history and movements in history and all that. Very rarely does it come into play in any of the X-Men movies. Uh, they did it sometimes in Days of Future Past and all that. Um, usually to good effect. And that was a kind of a cute little moment where they, the, uh, him and the old man bonded over motorcycles. And he's talking about like a 1948 bike because he served in that war. Like, <laughs> he was around back then. <laughs> well, 48 is long after the war, but you gotta I mean, like, he was fully active. Ah, oh, good times. So yeah, a lot of the scene worked really well. It's just it's not in a good spot in the movie because now like, oh, we're getting into the comedic relief for some reason. How fun! We're gonna just ignore all that really depressing stuff that happens, but it also has lost all weight. And we should be long gone from the barn. But Logan needs a nice jacket. And apparently he's just the exact same size as that man's son, who's dead, I guess. I, I assume they might have said it on the line and talked over or something, but... There we go. You had a jacket, Logan. I guess this is the jacket he wore in X-Men or something? It's not really iconic in that sense. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> That's not terrible. Like, there's actually funny lines in all of this farm business. It's just a uh, big waste of time. Oh, we're so glad to be able to give you our dead son's jacket and... Oh, right. Well, that is sad. I guess. <laughs> but like I said, tone. I was just enjoying the comedic relief and just getting used to that. And now we're getting to the old couple is murdered and we're gearing up for a bit of a fight scene. And it's going to be overblown and terrible, like always. Hey, Logan, do you want to uh, look up into the sky and shout, No! Because you should. No? Or should I say, No? <laughs> okay. Oh, right. I forgot that this movie's pathetic attempts to be cool. So I get how Logan survived the explosion. How did the motorcycle survive the explosion? And where did it go? Oh, there it is. Oh, that was uh, Zero who jumped into the helicopter. Well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but still. So thanks for the stuff, nice old couple. Your sacrifice will be remembered until Logan gradually transitions into an X-Men uniform. <laughs> uh, and you'll never be reflected on again. My silver fox has a reasonable chance of showing up in flashbacks or something. How is that copter keeping track of him still? So these are like the fake woods in like BC or something that I assume they're filming us. That like every pseudo cheap television show is filmed in these days. Like Stargate Atlantis. These look like those woods. The Stargate Atlantis woods. I could be wrong, but. <laughs> It's just all very generic forest. And because he's Canadian, like Logan's Canadian and his backstory is like tethered to that, it, it all works out perfectly, doesn't it? Yep. We're all just having a great time here. So we know Logan's not going to die. It, pretty much throughout this entire movie. So the only stakes are really to these military guys we don't give a crud about. And Agent Zero, who we definitely don't give a crud about, and are just looking forward to his inevitable cool demise. Probably at Logan's hands right here, but you never know. I mean, Zero did just gun down that couple, so Logan would kind of be justified in that. And he's not exactly out of his character. Now, why am I sure I'm about to see something ridiculous? Looks a little ridiculous to me. Although that being said, if um, that truck slammed into the copter, it would be even worse. <coughs> this at least reading has some plausibility. Until now! Boom! <coughs> Just, okay. 
You know how I was talking about how ridiculous it looks and he slices through the Jeep and almost hit the cop too? Well, it was a lot worse when he did it. <coughs> and look, it's almost getting into the point of like fastball special where like Colossus or somebody just tosses Logan high into the air and then he's just this deadly projectile like that. And to be honest, that kind of works in a comic book movie. But this movie isn't giving off that tone of like kind of goofy over the top action. Like it is. But not when the action scenes aren't happening. Like, when the action scenes aren't happening, we have this far more serious character piece slash weird, misplaced, um, like, comedic edge to it. And while none of that mixes to begin with, like, I feel like the tone of the movie doesn't fit the tone of the action at all. And it's two heads of a different beast. And that really throws things off. And then you have weird aspects of the movie, like the farm stuff. Or like the Lumberjack stuff. Or like the Logan and Sabretooth fighting in all the wars. And they also feel like those scenes belong to completely separate movies. So just this weird mix of all this stuff. And this ends up being one of the worst comic book movies because of it. Like it isn't the worst. You have like Catwoman, Batman and Robin. And I haven't seen Jonah X, but <laughs> I think that one probably is very good. Um, so there's quite a few other lousy comic book movies, like Green Lantern, like Ryan Reynolds, that you were in that movie, weren't you? And then I... This might be worse than Green Lantern, though, because at least Green Lantern is cohesive. It's not very good, but it all is stuck together in one relatively consistent tone. This movie is just all over the place. Oh, Agent Zero, are you dying? I don't think anyone cares. And this whole setup is stupid. So he ignites the gas with his claws because the helicopter had a beat. And then he creates this massive explosion that helicopters cannot explode like that big. And then he doesn't look back because he's cool. Which would later, that scene does show up in Cool Guys Don't Look at Explosions, the SNL digital short. And there's good reason because it's freaking ridiculous. So now we got guns with adamantium bullets or something like that that can stop Logan or something, I assume. Yeah, I... Wouldn't he be able to heal from that, though? Like, I get the bullets would be able to penetrate his skull, but Logan's healed from a lot worse. Maybe I'm wrong. Munson! You're back! Half a billion dollars. That sounds about right. Pretty sure that's Cyclops, who's going to be horribly inserted into this story along with a bunch of other mutants that are better than any of this. Yep, there he is. This sort of damages Scott's character simply by association, along with like Emma Frost and a few others. Scott Summers is having trouble in Spanish because his fabulous um, red sunglasses are distracting him. Mostly because they're there for no other reason other than to just let us know that he's Cyclops without, you know, working for it. <laughs> hey, well, I am back in this movie after like a good half hour. Um, I'm not sure if it was better or worse without him. I'll be honest, he's one of the more charming aspects of this story, if you ask me. Because <laughs> he's got his own little personality, he's a good ally to Logan, and they kind of get it together, and his powers are pretty neat and actually useful and different from everyone else's, so it all kind of works. Like, Agent Zero's powers are so undefined in comparison. But he and Blob, and even back when he was alive, Dominic Monaghan, they were a little more compelling. Yeah, like, you know, he's not a great actor, but he's not the worst. He kind of brings a certain weight to his character or something. I don't know why he's always wearing cowboy hats. I think that's just a lazy attempt to create character where there is none, but... Yeah. Why do we keep referring to Africa? Like, it's this big thing. You know Africa is more than one place. Was it because they weren't allowed to reference Wakanda? But they wanted to keep it vague to sort of be somewhat 
coyly referring to it? Or is it just because this movie like reeks of Americanisms? Including not really worrying about or being worried about whether people know anything more specific than Africa. Like, God forbid we say something like Uganda. Or maybe they would avoid criticism. But it just sounds weird when you say, do you remember Africa? That one time we were in Africa? You know, I, I remember when I visited North America, um, traveling from my home in North America to visit North America and all its prestigious uh, scenery of Disney World and Disneyland and uh, New York City and all the other wonderful... <laughs> non-specific aspects of North America. My point is, Africa is a very vague term in that sense. The big continent. <laughs> and you know, I do like Blob in this movie. I think he's, um, he's kind of fun. He kind of looks like what I'd expect him to look like without maybe going, like, overly bored. He's sensitive about being called Blob, apparently, even though Logan didn't call him Blob. And... I said Bob. Oh, okay. That's not too bad. But honestly, let's go through everything wrong with this. So, Blob has never, as a character, been that sensitive about his weight from what I've seen. He, he relishes in it. That's where his power comes from. So it's sort of weird that he just gets completely upset at the mere mention of it. But even if that was like a prequel thing, it's, it's very 2D. Then Will I Am suggests that these two get into a boxing fight together. <laughs> and apparently Logan just is all out of care for his own character because he just goes along with it. Like, oh sure, let's have a boxing match to settle these life and death stuff, because that fits in with the character who's been fighting and killing everyone. I will play your game with you, sir. And Logan's not fighting with any dignity here, either. I can think he'd try a different strategy after the first few punches don't do anything. And I admit, well, I am character who has rather minding is really just getting obnoxious in the scene. And remember what I was saying about tone? Like, the action just doesn't fit the tone. Why would Logan go along with any of this? How does this fit? Like, it just feels very lighthearted and happy compared to the stuff proceeding and coming after this. He's on the run from the military, he's a fugitive, and he agrees to just play a little boxing game and put on gloves and all that stuff. Probably mostly just for the gag of the claws going through the boxing glove like that. Now, this scene could have been a lot darker, <laughs> but instead, Scott Summers is Bart Simpsoning in his classroom right now, alone and unsupervised, so he can be kidnapped. Why does Scott know just to run? To run like this, <laughs> not just find the teacher who should be uh, supervising? See, I do like that aspect of Sabretooth in this movie, as he jumps around like an animal and all that. It looks fake as all hell, but it fits. Ah, and that was really cool, too. I didn't remember that. It didn't look great, but it looked kind of cool. That didn't make sense either. See, direction's off on this movie. Like, uh... Sabretooth shouldn't have looked all shocked at seeing Striker there. Striker either ordered him here, or Sabretooth's just hunting down Cyclops for no explained reason. And see, this is it feels like a very dramatic scene. Coming off of Logan being like, oh sure, I'll blocks with you, that'll be fun. Their weight classes are, well actually they're probably okay, but... Seems off is all I'm saying. Does that gun beep and knock somebody out when he touches somebody with it? Oh, see, they are looking together. So, <laughs> Sabretooth looking surprised was just a mislead that just makes no sense. 
uh, I need to stop analyzing this movie, but I literally have nothing else to do. <laughs> this is boring. I'm not really enjoying these scenes. They're just happening. And if you're wondering why I put myself through this, well, that's kind of a good question. But I thought it'd be funny to just laugh at this movie. I'll be honest, though. It's not that funny. <laughs> like, it's getting boring at this point. And that's, that's kind of the problem with this movie. Like, at least you can watch Batman and Robin, and it's so bad that at least you can get some sort of enjoyment out of it. This is just awful. And not in a fun way, just in a depressing way. But what makes it a little more amusing is the fact that Fox did kind of manage to recover. Like, I really liked First Class. And, uh, the Wolverine isn't too bad, and Days of Future Past is pretty good, and I think Deadpool will be, uh, a decent movie. Mostly because they seem to have recognized what's good about Deadpool, uh, as opposed to this movie, which I think just fundamentally didn't understand what was that appealing about the character. Like, I never relished in Deadpool's, uh, humor. Nor did it really, um, I think, get the point of that character. Like it's supposed to be kind of just somewhere between a parody and just a, a personality. I don't know. Feels like a very cliched plot for a villain. Going after superheroes' powers, they combine them into one big Hulkasaurus. And what's that Hulkasaurus' name? Well, we'll find out soon enough. I'm sure it's gonna be great! Is, is, does anyone else think it's a little weird that uh, Wade Wilson was just said to be gone and hasn't been referred to since? Like Ryan Reynolds was a pretty big actor, he, like, back in 2009. Does anyone else think it's weird that they didn't really use that character any more than they did? Anyone? No? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Oh! And now, for some reason, we need to find Gambit, and without any apparent effort or difficulty, we find Gambit at this bar. And, oh boy. So, I will say this. They did one thing right about Gambit, and that's that his character is from somewhere around New Orleans. And that's about it. Now we have Tim Riggins here. And I'm not sure if that's going to be better or worse than Channing Tatum, but in either case, both are wrong. Like, both just do not feel right for Gambit as a character. Um, and do not reflect an understanding of that. Like, realistically, the person who should be playing a Cajun character is a Cajun man, and probably someone who you haven't heard of. It's not that famous, but it's a good actor and fits the visible role of uh, Remy LeBeau and, and his accent and his character. And there's something to say about authenticity, guys, over going for the lowest common denominator of stardom. <sighs> I'm not looking forward to the Gambit movie this year. But I could be wrong. Seems like Deadpool has mostly worked out. <laughs> I'd love to be wrong here. But it's content like this that makes me doubt their, like, Fox's ability to satisfactorily depict Gambit. Now, watching this movie, I can say the exact same thing about Deadpool, and here we are, like, seven years later, and they're doing a much better job. Well, pretty sure Will I Am is, uh, rounding up for the next exit ramp. And to be honest, it's the best thing for his career is to leave this movie as soon as possible. Now, multiple people pointed out that, uh, it seems unlikely Will I Am would be killable at all about being able to teleport. But I think the important thing to understand is that you're not trying to outrace the teleport, which is instantaneous. Uh, you're trying to outrace John Ray's instincts, which is presumably not instantaneous. And, you know, it kind of makes sense that Sabretooth would have faster instincts than John Ray. So I think it is quite plausible that he'd be able to, like, out-predict and beat Rafe, because, you know, he's not nearly as skilled as a combatant. See? He was just able to predict where he was going to be. I don't know. I think that's pretty straightforward. Other people have said that scene makes no sense. Personally, I think it's fine. 
And this is also kind of neat. He's teleporting in and out of, uh, phase. So he's, like, feeling his spine and is able to, like, rip it out. Like I said, there are cool ideas in this movie, just the execution's way off. And you know, as much as I'm reluctant to say that like, gore and violence add something, I think it actually would have given that scene more impact if they actually showed him ripping his spine out, and if this movie had a little more balls than being just this PG-13 mess that's afraid to act out. That's one thing the Wolverine did right, is he kind of recognized that a Wolverine tale needs a little bit of darkness in it. That's probably why Deadpool is going to do a lot better, too. Sometimes censorship really can wreck a movie, and other times it doesn't really matter. I, the Marvel movies can kind of get away with not being too violent or sweary or anything like that, because it's not really in the tone of the movies. Uh, most X-Men movies can, too, but uh, Wolverine's character just isn't up for the bill. Neither is Deadpool. Uh, and it's kind of good to know that Fox eventually figured that out. But they sure didn't realize that here. Those claws still look awful, by the way. I'm just, just saying. Also, this is like the second or third time Sabretooth has fought Wolverine. And it's kind of losing its impact. This was already a thing in the X-Men movies. And you know how I was saying he was animalistic? It just looks goofy in a scene like this. When he's like pouncing like that. It worked better in Quick Little Cuts than at school, but here he just looks like a little kid. And see, that would be awesome if it didn't look fake as hell. And it's the sort of thing you kind of could do in practical effects. And because you're so close to their faces and stuff, I think you do need to rely on practical effects more often than not, or really good CGI for Logan's Claws. Hey look, Gambit did a thing. I still don't fully understand Gambit's role in this story. I think he, like, escaped from the Weapon X program, so he's going to help Logan find it. But it is not at all clear. <laughs> and Sabretooth just leaves, because it's not time for the final battle yet. Holy cow, it looks like we still have like half an hour to this nonsense. And I am not so much running out of things to talk about, but just bored. Oh, they repeated the middle finger gag from the first movie. I didn't know they did that. That was so disappointing. It was funny the first time. I mean, you can't really... Not the kind of gag that works twice. It was very visual, very sudden. Also, I don't know how Gambit climbed uh, the side of a building like that, but... Okay, whatever. Gambit can do whatever he wants. I guess a cool character in the comics and several of the cartoons. Like, I do like Gambit. I just... <laughs> like, Channing Tatum just sounds wrong for the role. And maybe he won't be. Maybe, like, maybe the guy's a really good doctor and will do it. It just, on its outset, it sounds weird. That's all I can say. Where, like, Ryan Reynolds always sounded like a great fit for Deadpool, Channing Tatum feels like what Tim Riggins here feels like for Gambit. Like, it just doesn't make sense. No, I don't feel either of those men have the range for Gambit, because he's very specific in his appeal. And look, he doesn't have to be this perfectly faithful representation of the, uh, First Gambit, but he, he needs to have something going on. I guess, like, if he's gonna be interesting, he shouldn't just be a generic movie star actor, like, I would think. And like I said, interpretation, adaptations, they can surprise you, and they don't necessarily have to be bad, but these are not great. So is that Striker's son? Is that what's supposed to be going on? See, none of it's clear when it's not the same actor and stuff. And I get why like, Ryan Cox isn't playing a much younger version of himself, but this guy doesn't look anything like Brian Cox. You don't even realize they're the same character. So Munson gets upset. And look at what they did to Deadpool. Why are they showing it now, anyways? I didn't realize that. This movie doesn't make sense. Like, if they wanted to make this big dramatic reveal, that wasn't the way to do it. And don't get me wrong, I agree with everyone that that reveal is dumb, and we'll talk about that soon, but I don't, I don't understand why they just showed him. <laughs> this movie's giving away its own spoilers. It's awful spoilers, but it still doesn't make sense. Oh, okay, so they did bring in Stryker's mutant son and all that. Could be an interesting connection to X-Men too. It isn't. And Munson knows it. (laughs) 
Ah. You've upset Munson, Striker. I'm so disappointed in you. I thought Weapon X was a Canadian program. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, in the comics, at least. I don't know. I just say it. You know, like, I feel bad for Americans sometimes. Like, that's one thing I liked about Weapon X is the idea that, like, you know, like, Canada's government can be just as messed up with secret programs as any other country, theoretically. Sure, Canada doesn't have nukes, but it's not like everything we've done is fantastic. I always thought that was a more interesting aspect of Logan's character is that he's from this Canadian thing, but uh, whatever. So, Tim Riggins is still just not really giving anything to the movie. What? <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, the base is on Three Mile Island. That's kind of dumb, too. I guess the idea is it's a separate facility from the one that's the dam in X2, but that doesn't make sense because wasn't Logan's water bed there? And I get these are different facilities, but which lets them destroy this one, but I, I don't know. Where is Three Mile Island? This seems... I, I am suspicious of everything here because it's like... I could be wrong, but yeah, Three Mile Island's like in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, I don't think that works. Pretty sure someone would notice. It just seems like a terrible place for a secret base. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> it makes it all the more ridiculous when this uh, place blows up. Hey, it's Cyclops again. Yeah, this movie doesn't use a lot of its characters very much, or often, or well. Um, no idea why or what the point of it all is. <laughs> Just seems uh, like this movie does a lot of things without really thinking through all the necessary merits of it. Like, yeah, we'll have Gambit, because he's popular, and Deadpool's popular, and we'll do Sabretooth and Logan, because them fighting is always fun, and then we'll do Weapon X, because that was interesting in X2, and we're talking about Logan's origins, so it's a natural fit. But nothing's quite balanced throughout this movie, so characters come and go, and they never really draw you into them, or they're memorable like in the X-Men movies. Like, there, there's so many different characters, and they're all kind of used. Maybe not evenly or perfectly, but, you, I don't know, you get excited about the entire team. <laughs> now, Deadpool's actual name, I do know the origins of, and it's a lot better than that, but whatever. Well, they're just casually operating on them in this weird room. A lot of uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine set design, very generic and boring. Um, there's a couple of exceptions, mostly stuff that doesn't make any sense, like the boxing arena, um, some of the farm settings and all that. Like They're okay, but very, very generic. So the boxing match kind of looked cool, but that whole thing just doesn't make sense. Like It was a weird thing for Will I Am and uh, What's His Face to be doing. Now, I always forget about this part. Like, is Silver Fox supposed to be alive and just part of Weapon X? I remember this happening in the uh, first time I watched this movie. And I was confused. And I forget how where this goes. Because the first time I watched this movie, by now, I was just so turned off with this entire ordeal. Like, why does that make Logan give up? How is that the revelation that like breaks him down? At the very least, I, I, I would assume it would call him into act, because either it's like, A, well maybe you actually do care for her, and you can, you know, work with her, 
Either way, she's alive. <laughs> and then you can, uh... Then you have options, is all I'm saying, as opposed to before when she was just dead. So why is this, like, devastating to you? So she is a mutant. She's Emma Frost's sister? Uh, none of this makes sense. She can influence people as long as she touches. So that's actually kind of neat. Uh, like, this big source of change in Logan's life was the result of, like, this mutant manipulation. And she does care about Logan. You know, maybe she's been coerced a little bit, Logan. Uh, it just feels weird that he gets immediately hit with the thought of, Oh, she betrayed me. There's no hope. And I'm just going to sit here and give up. Instead of, like, just killing Stryker and getting on with this story. <laughs> Screw you, movie. Oh, that is dumb. <laughs> uh oh. I thought you were the moon, and I was the green. I heard the trickster. Ah, uh, that could be good writing in the right hands. <laughs> like she tells the story, and it turns out to have this different meaning, but it falls so flat here for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think it all lines up perfectly, <laughs> like in terms of making sense and all that. Two, it was never really hinted at. Um, and three. We were never given a reason to really emphasize with Logan and his love for this girl. Like, I still think more of Logan's feelings with Jean Grey, and those had more of an effect on the story in The Wolverine. And I get that, all, that none of that's happened yet, but... You see how one kind of undermines the other anyways? Like, we know Logan's going to live through all this, we know Logan's going to go on to these things, so we know she can't be that important to Logan. Or at least anymore. <laughs> he just leaves. Because this consists of good planning. That was the right thing to do there. And like I said, that's the appropriate reaction to this scenario. <laughs> but this movie doesn't care about sense or anything. Like, wouldn't that be Logan's reaction? Like, oh, your sister's been kidnapped. And if I, like, help her escape, we can be happy together. But no, I have to assume the worst about everything. And I get that he probably feels he got manipulated into going through all that Weapon X stuff, but hey, look, you're all strong now. Like, Maybe you should just accept what happens, Logan, and enjoy the opportunities that are given to you. Does that like a fun idea? No? No? You know, one thing I did mention, because it happened right at the beginning of the movie that I do like, that I'm thinking about now, is the idea of uh, Sabretooth. And Logan being sick at a young age, and that was kind of an early signaling of their healing factors. That's kind of clever. I did like that. Uh, why I'm bringing this up now is just Sabretooth reminded me of it. <laughs> As he's murdering Silver Fox. Except for Logan's here. Posing off. In his tank top. That pose was ridiculous. Like, there's no explanation for that other than, it looks cool. That is not a fighting stance. This does not put you in an advantageous position, even with your claws. This does. Bam! This is the best of the, like, three or four Sabretooth fights that have happened. Mostly because stuff's actually happening, and it's kind of brutal. And, you know... I think they wanted Sabretooth to kind of be the maniacal combo character he was. But Leif Schreiber kind of gives off different vibes, so he's a little inconsistent. The Sabretooth doesn't really have much of a presence in this movie, like he should. And Logan struggles whether or not to be an animal. Which is, the struggle feels out of place with the earlier stuff, like in the X-Men. Like, I feel like he kind of went through it again already in the future stories, so he's just going through it twice one way or another. I don't know. It doesn't really track well with me. But him punching Sabretooth in the face does. That always makes sense. <laughs> Can't go wrong there. So who's going to fight him now? Is this, is this where it all goes downhill? It's 
See, everything will work out just fine. Except for I remember what happens to her character now. Wait for it. Wait for it. Maybe it's not happening now. Pretty sure it is. I'll give it time. Weapon 11. Ugh. I'm not looking forward to Weapon 11. But it's not that I don't want to give it away. So let's just talk about it now. So, if there's one reason this movie is particularly poorly remembered, although I should mention that everything up until now has been bad anyways, and if this didn't happen, this would still be an atrocious movie, is what Weapon 11 is. So, apparently Deadpool <laughs> is a sewn up like mouth monstrosity who has all these different mutant powers instead of the powers Deadpool actually has. Which, by the way, would actually be kind of interesting for like a character like Deadpool. Is like someone who could regenerate far more than Logan and is just proficient with weapons and they have this history together and he talks all funny. But no, no. What they do to Deadpool in this movie is just an abomination. <laughs> and you know, he, again, just like Sabretooth or Gambit or any of the other characters they ruined in this story, adaptation allows for change. It's okay. Like, you can change things, you can move things in the other direction. The issue isn't that they changed Deadpool, it's that they made him just completely uninspired and completely entertaining. So he ends up kind of being this generic monster of the week thing. The Silver Thoughts live? I assume... No, well, we'll get into what I assume. I don't know what's going to happen with her anymore. I don't remember. Obviously she can't really be a presence anymore because she didn't drop in the preceding X-Men movies. There we go, there's Weapon 11. And look. So far we're okay with red, and then everything... <laughs> so there's no mouth, because apparently they didn't want to have a fun villain. And all of his powers are wrong, and he looks wrong, and he doesn't say or do anything interesting, and that's not even really Ryan Reynolds, it's just some stuntman all d done up. <sighs> and it just, it would have been fun. The movie would still be bad, but it would at least be kind of cool if it was just Deadpool that showed up in this scene, and he's got that mask on, and he's just like, Hey, Wolverine! <laughs> is just fighting it up, and I get that it wouldn't be the most dramatic of scenes, but this movie's already all over the place in tone anyways. Oh, and I guess the idea is Stryker's piloting him. That's kind of neat, but it, this is all just very pointless. And he doesn't look all cancer or anything. Anything that would be fun for Deadpool. And I don't mind change. But there could have been certain aspects of his character worked around. I mean, I don't see the point of um, creating a character that the very idea behind him is the merc with the mouth and you don't give him a mouth. But they've ranged like how thoughtful his character is. Like he He has a real personality, but also like real emotions, I guess, especially in like some of the newer comics, or I'm thinking even back in Uncanny X-Force. And Emma Frost is kind of doing cool things here. Um, it's a real shame that her diamond stuff makes no sense and looks awful. That could have been like an early setup for Scott and Emma Frost, which I'm guessing is what they were maybe going to go for one day. And then Emma Frost was pretty cool in friggin' uh, First Class. And that all just is, she apparently died in Days of Future Past. <laughs> but it really isn't a great use of her character, and hopefully she'll turn up in some form one day. So yeah, she's just gonna die, I guess. It wasn't a very dramatic death. I thought Weapon 11 was gonna kill her. Maybe he still will. So. He can teleport. He can make claws. It just seems wrong for Deadpool. <laughs> There's no personality either. And then there's one more cameo that we just got the little hints of. It's honestly just a waste. <laughs> waste of perfectly good Patrick Stewart. <laughs> so why did Logan even climb this thing? Just to get him, like, weighed away from everyone else? Surprise, I can teleport. That actually is kind of a good little look, like, oh, great. 
Now you have to fight him up on this dangling ridge. I guess it's just done for dramatic states. I don't know. Feels kind of Simpsons nuclear power planty to me. <laughs> Could have been dramatic. Decapitate. Oh, okay. So, so far the uh, commands Wade Wilson has been given is engage and decapitate. Seems like engage was generic enough to allow for something like that. And you know, that is a decent use of saber tooth right there. Like, nobody kills you but me. Now let's have this awesome fight together. And to be honest, it is like the best fight in this movie. <laughs> um, doesn't say much. Like, at all. <laughs> but actually, I actually do kind of like the idea of them teaming up at the end. Like, it's kind of, it's kind of a good resolution of their arc. Saber Tooth and Logan are about the closest thing we have to a real relationship in this movie that actually works and pays off. Um. Maybe because it should have been and they spent some time there. Oh, hey, that kind of looks like, uh, Deadpool's mask on his face vaguely. See, so maybe they were actually getting at something there. Like I said, interpretation isn't terrible, but this just doesn't, doesn't work. Like, it feels like just such a fundamental change that I don't even know why they bothered. I mean, there's a bunch of other characters this could have worked for. Um, like Omega Red, actually. He really looks and feels like a good Omega Red. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just do that. And you know what? Deadpool would have been a great side character. Like, how cool would it have been if Deadpool was kind of in the Will I Am role? And was kind of like Wolverine's pseudo friend slash ally and helped him out and then he just got tragically killed by Sabretooth. Like, that would have a lot more weight because everyone loves Deadpool. And I'm not saying you should kill him off so easily, but at least that would make sense. Like, <laughs> look what they did to him in comparison. <laughs> and, uh, you know... I could say that was neat how the tower's been torn apart by his eye beams. But I'd be lying. That's pretty lame. Doesn't make sense. Isn't that cool? You know, it's just a cooling tower, right? Like, there isn't a lot of, like, nuclear... whatever. This isn't an active nuclear power plant, so it doesn't really have much of a weight. It's just... backdrop. Oh yeah, we still have the adamantium bullets. Because in my mind, the movie's pretty much over at this point. But, uh, we still have a good 15 minutes of nonsense to sit through. Oh, right. Now I remember what the adamantium bullets are for. His memory won't go back. I don't think that's really how the brain would work in that situation, but I could be wrong. And that actually could make sense. Like, his brain goes back, but the encoding in his neurons doesn't. Alright, whatever. But it's really just convenient so that Logan doesn't remember his past because he doesn't in the movies or in general, so they have to do that. So it's all just sort of out of obligation. Um, that works, okay. But it kind of just undermine, like, gets into the whole lack of a point between this movie. Because we kind of went into Logan's past already in X-Men 2, and we kind of went into all this memory stuff, and it just doesn't seem that much of a purpose. I do like how he and Sabretooth sort of leave things in this movie. Um, I think that's kind of an appropriate reflection of the characters. Like, they're not friends, and never really will be, but they are more rivals than enemies. <laughs> I forgot about that. Hey, it's Gambit! Miss me? You were barely in this movie, buddy. Who are, like, what, why did you just show up like this? Not gonna help rescue a bunch of kids, but you're just gonna show up to save Logan as a nuclear tower's falling for kicks? Screw you, Tim Riggins. Well, thanks for helping save the kids. I'm gonna go waste time over here. So, yeah. She does die. Just in a less dramatic way than I assumed. It'd be kind of cool to see more of her powers in action at some point in this movie. Not just, like, apparently influencing Logan. Uh, that seems, um... 
just a dramatic like a plot twist for the sake of having a plot twist. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, he's getting along. This wasn't as boring as I thought it would be, but it was pretty boring. <laughs> it wasn't as disappointing as I thought it would be, but it was pretty disappointing. And as they walk into the sunset, this happens because it has to. Probably hurts like the dickens. And we know Stryker's going to live through this because he has to. This is kind of the inherent problem with prequels. Especially prequels so close to the source material of the first three movies. Um, a lot of stuff just doesn't make sense or add up. Like, Striker has to live. Wolverine has to live. Silver Fox has to die. And Logan loses his memories because it all just has to work out that way. It's so nothing shocking or... Nothing surprises us. I admit if you saw this movie without seeing the first X-Men, or without knowing anything about the X-Men movies, it probably would register better. But, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, see? We do get to see your powers in action a little bit. You should. You'd save a lot of people a lot of grief, but you're not going to. That's kind of cool, though, because <laughs> she could probably do something like that. And, you know, showing off powers when you can, always good. Nice use of mind control there. Amateur compared to that stuff nowadays, but, you know, that's fine. And then she dies, I guess. Knowing Logan is doomed to forget her, which is kind of tragic, but again, you'd think it would register more if they tried to make it register more. And now Charles Xavier shows up, having helped no one, but here to save the day. Apparently just discovering a bunch of mutants cobbled together and, like, with their powers being stolen. And everyone except for Scott Summers will never be mentioned again. And he's just gonna talk to them telepathically because he can. Although it is a good way to show him that, like, hey, look, I got powers too. Come along on this helicopter. But not you, Gambit. You have done enough in this movie. Which is nothing. And you're not going to join the X-Men. Because that would be a plot hole. So goodbye forever until you are recast. <laughs> and thank God for that, I guess. But ugh. It's going to be very interesting. I, I, I want to see the Gambit trailers when they come out. Because I'm very curious what Channing Tatum's going to be like. You know, Channing Tatum is great. I've seen him in... uh a lot of stuff I really do like, uh, specifically like the Jump Street movies, and even just the little appearance he had and This Is the End. I, he can't act. I'm just not sure Gambit's the right role for him. I'd love to be wrong about that. I didn't expect much out of the Deadpool movie until I saw the trailers, and it looks like it's going to be pretty promising. I hope you guys all look forward to it. Oh, and poor Gambit lost... Uh, his best friend, uh, Wolverine, because he doesn't remember anything anymore. Hugh Jackman's a pretty good actor. <laughs> After all of this, uh, terrible material, he can still make something like this come to life. Um, my buddy who I was going to do this commentary with, but he just wasn't available in time. Uh, isn't a fan of him playing Logan, but I, I actually think he's pretty good. Um, he's a good actor. He pulls off a lot of Logan's mannerisms very well. and You see it in something like this where he's lost his memory. Uh, don't worry about that, Logan. It's just your dead of love interest. You're not really going to remember, so it's okay. Um... You can't act. Like I said, this... And, you know, Tim Riggins here can act, too. I keep calling him that because uh, that was his role in Friday Night Lights, and that's the only thing I know him from. 
But he, he's a good actor in that story. Or in that TV show, I should say. So, you really can't blame any of these actors. And Patrick Stewart's like a masterful actor. He just looks like an absolute human freak because of the weird digital gauging thing they did. Um, but the writers, particularly the rewriters, like it seems like the script got a couple of bad rewrites that just made this movie fall apart. And the director didn't care enough to like make changes or make it into a cohesive movie with the same tone throughout or anything like that. So we have this kind of depressing ending, but really it's just because it has to be, because it has to set up certain elements of the X-Men movies. And again, like I'm wondering, what's the point of it at all? You know, that would have been the cooler thing about like, um, like a Magneto story, for example, is we would have, you know, they're, they're less boxed in, because it's farther back, they could have done more stuff. Really, all we had seen at that point of Magneto's backstory was just a couple of scenes in, like, Auschwitz, like, him bending the metal gate and all. They had so much more they could have worked with. <laughs> it's just so weird, like, the movie ends on Three Mile Island like that, and that is it. Except there's the post credit scene. And I don't know if most of you know this, so, uh, if you want to sit with me for the credits, we can take a look at the post credit scene, and I do want to talk about it a bit, because basically it's, uh, um, that's very standard, but, uh, yeah, and Deadpool's gonna show up, and his eyes are gonna open, even though his head was, like, cut off in three places. Um, which kind of fits with the healing factor thing. Oh, are there two post-credit scenes? I didn't even realize that. Striker just walking along. Like I said, that, that was a nice little ending for his character. So, like, uh, they do try and fit in some sort of punishment for all of Stryker's horrible behavior, but whatever. <laughs> you killed Munson, sir. But obviously the trouble doesn't stick because Stryker's fine in X2. Okay, well that was post credit scene one. The other post credit scene is uh, way terrible setup. And Luckily, they don't really use it as fodder for anything going forward. It's all but just wiped out of continuity at this point. I guess. I don't even know. It's hard to tell. I hope that, like, nothing from here really persists, because this movie doesn't offer anything. It doesn't further the story meaningfully. It just kind of shuffles around with different nonsense and never really quite sticks. But look at all these people involved. Like, like I said, I, I, you know, everyone here is just happy to be working, doing the best with their job. Um, but I have a feeling like this didn't really have a budget that it needed. It didn't have the writing or direction that it needed. So you just have everyone kind of doing their best with lousy material, probably under a tight le deadline, and it just doesn't work. And you know, Every studio has made a bad movie of some form or another, with the possible exception of Marvel, like you could argue that one at least, but no one quite has made any like terrible bombs as much as Fox. Because <laughs> you have a movie like this, you have the Fantastic Fours, practically all of them. They seem to misfire a lot, and I think it's because they're cheap. A lot of their movies look really cheap and generic design in their sets and costumes and all that. And this one's one of the worst for that. Very little inspiration behind a lot of this. Yeah. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. And just remember this, and I hope you guys um, watch the movie with this, or just listen to my commentary as I react to the movie as we go, but like, this is how bad it could get. Um, and as we enjoy the new Deadpool movie, and Zoolander 2 and anything else coming out this weekend, uh, it's important to remember that it it could have been a lot worse. And you know, I think Deadpool will be good. I haven't heard anything wrong with it, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> Visual effects by Hydraw Licks. Sounds like just a wonderful company. That did not do a good job. I don't know who to blame at it. Like, I'm sure all those people are very hardworking people and genuinely, like, artists that are trying, but... 
Oh, there's a few companies that did visual effects. Well, that might explain something too. Because I guarantee you one of these companies was exclusively responsible for those claws, and they look awful. Um, but some of the other CGI does look a little better, so it kind of makes sense that it's uneven like that. And like, look, look, a lot of people worked on this. I'm sure this had a decent budget in that sense. But, oh man, I don't understand it. <laughs> like, they probably went halfway with it, and with a comic book movie, you really shouldn't. And that being said, a lot of the Marvel movies were made for cheap, and they look okay. Maybe too many cooks spoiled the bra. Something went terribly wrong. Like I said, I point to like the rewriting aspects of like how many times this uh, movie was rewritten. Um, a lack of direction, I would think, but a real inspiration behind it. And it was just, uh, it represented a failure in a lot of directions. Like a failure to really launch Wolverine movies as a franchise. Like they barely eked out a sequel to this years later and it really shows a change in tone and direction from this. Um, you can tell they learned a lot of lessons <laughs> from this movie. And it kind of clobbered the idea of an X-Men Origins movie. Because it was just so bad. And I think this really kind of put X-Men movies into a void for a while. Um, the Last Stand was bad enough, but this was the final nail in the coffin. And it wasn't until First Class that we ever really got back in the swing of things. And that was only a couple of years or so, but it was... It felt like they had to really do a big shift and go in another direction and recast a bunch of actors because it just... This wasn't working. Oh, but if you like the soundtrack, you can... Uh, it's available on Brace Sarabande. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Very generic soundtrack, I have to say. Nothing uh, too inspiring or anything like that. New Zealand Film Commission. This is filmed in New Zealand, eh? Well, it sure looked like Canada to me, which is kind of impressive, but also really depressing. <laughs> like, it didn't... That's, uh... That is surprising to find out. And yes, it's time for the last post credit scene. Which is so totally worth their wait. And we have some rubble here. Uh, yeah, that's very... You know, it looks okay. It's kind of neat to see the cooling tower, like with the arc like that, but uh, nothing that special. It's never really used any dramatic effect. Oh, my word. Is that a hand moving there? Oh, it's Wade's head. See you next movie. <laughs> And that's the wonderful conclusion to X-Men Origins Wolverine. One final F you to the fans who you ruined their favorite character with Deadpool. You just, they can't resist putting that final axe into the ground and saying, no, this terrible version of Deadpool is still alive until everything got fixed in Days of Future Past. Well, thanks for watching the commentary, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit of an experiment. Um, it's going to be one of those things where uh, I wouldn't just be sitting here staring at the YouTube screen or doing it, but if you uh, are looking for an entertaining lark as we went through a terrible, terrible movie, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I, I think I've talked for long enough. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.